Greetings folks, Jeff Forrester here. Today I'm going to talk about aggregates and clay bodies by special request. And there's any number of aggregates a person could potentially put into their clay and several reasons why you might want to do that. Probably the most common use of aggregates in clay is just to give the clay body some structural integrity. We talked about clays with heavy grogs resisting thermal shock and so there are other types of aggregates you can include that would do similar things and then also just the strength of the clay and especially if you're building bigger thicker pieces having that extra tooth in the clay body allows for it leaves the clay more porous and allows for moisture to kind of escape out from the inside of things so I'm gonna look at I've got a number I think four or five different types of aggregates here and I'll talk about why you might use some and the proper technique in doing so. So for starters I'm going to start with more common aggregates and of course there's grog which is essentially stoneware that's been fired to temperature and pulverized. So usually when you see it it looks a lot like sand but you can also order that special order that through the ceramic store in Houston not to mention probably ceramic suppliers elsewhere and get that in a coarser grain so it's much bigger chunks of grog and then I've got here a bag of perlite usually you find this in like a garden section at Home Depot or Lowe's I, we have a tractor supply store close to us here and so that's a go-to resource for me for things like perlite, vermiculite, I've got some decomposed granite right here that came from there. So, otherwise you can often find those things online as well and just order those, that's an option. So the perlite, if you're not familiar with that, is this, these little white pellets. If you've ever had potting soil, a bag of potting soil, you've probably seen that in there. And so, that's most commonly used in soils, which is why you find it in the garden section. And what it does is basically aerates the soil so that water drains. So the interesting thing about this is this is essentially volcanic glaze. So most perlite has some potassium, sodium, and any number of other melting agents in it. And actually when it's found near a volcano, it is full of water and so it's a lot it's a lot actually smaller and more dense and the perlite that we purchase actually has been subject subjected to heat to burn that water off and then similar to popcorn what happens is that expands and you have like this really light kind of airy dry material so because that has been tempered in a kiln and the moisture has been driven out if you use it straight out of the bag, it'll actually suck moisture out of your clay. So if you're gonna if you're gonna put the dry perlite into clay, you actually have to work relatively quickly because that clay is gonna dry out much quicker than what you're used to. Alright, most people, if they're using perlite, will soak it in water for a time and probably 24 hours is best practice but for the sake of this demo I did it for just like a half hour or so but this way the perlite absorbs a little bit of moisture and when you put it into your clay it doesn't immediately pull all the moisture out of the clay you're trying to build with right so I've actually and I've, I've actually prepped a few things here and so probably the most common way to impregnate your clay body with an aggregate is simply to wedge it in there and I'll do that with one or two but I've already wedged some aggregates and different clays here and pinched out some pots just to expedite the speed of this demo so you're not sitting watching that mundane process. Alright so vermiculite actually works very similar to grog or perlite and essentially what that is, is it comes from a mica family and so it's basically 
clay that's been re really almost brought to temperature so it's almost just like adding a coarse grog into your clay body so I talked a little bit about the different fluxes that make up perlite and so the same thing with vermiculite is going to have a different chemical or mineral composition and so both of these things could vary a little bit and potentially produce actually flashing or glazing marks in a clay body but more often than not I've seen the perlite just burn out and leave a void and the ver vermiculite often you get like a little kind of sparkly specks where that vermiculite is or I've, I've actually not witnessed but read that people have sprinkled it on the pieces and then it actually fumes and leaves like a metallic golden almost halo like fumy mark so that could be potentially something to try um, other things the decomposed granite so I've got this in a vase here because this bag is basically deteriorating I've had it so long but basically what that is is paltry grit like I said I got it at a feed and farm store or a tractor supply and they actually feed this to chickens to help with their digestion and there, there's actually so this is this is insoluble crushed granite you can actually get water soluble as well which you want to avoid so it's imperative you use insoluble crushed granite if you're going to use this chicken poultry because I actually had a potter who was at the studio at Glass L. He purchased accidentally the wrong granite and embedded it in a bunch of pots. I think he fired, man, there must have been 60, 70 pots sitting as greenware in the metal shell was waiting for bisque. And I went in the next day to load the kiln and those pots had all decomposed essentially. And I'm guessing what happened is something similar to when I tried to impregnate my clay with rice. So I took rice grains and just wedged it into my clay body and because it was dry what happened is it sucked moisture out of the clay and expanded and my pieces had all just a spiderweb network of hairline cracks. And so I tried to pick this big like funnel shaped piece up and it just basically decomposed in my hands, right, turned into thousands of shards. So insoluble chicken granite and so this essentially is just granite which is feldspar and so at low temperatures and I'm guessing even 5, 6 although I'm gonna have to test that to be for certain it's actually not going to change very much in the kiln but at cone 10 this will actually start to flux out a little bit and what it'll do is leave like little glassy kind of whitish cream, cream yellow colored beads of pebbles in your clay which can be quite nice. So other common materials or things that I've added to my clay in the past and just so happens I've experimented a lot with aggregates and so a common thing I like to use is silicon carbide you can wedge that into your clay so basically what that does is the, it's the, the functioning ingredient in a lava glaze right those really bubbly kind of magma looking glazes and it's basically what makes that glaze what it is and so what happens is the silicon carbide produces gases during the firing and when the gases are escaping through the glaze at a, at a specific temperature the glaze starts to kind of bubble and pit and get those craters that is common in lava glazes and so by impregnating my clay with that it's sort of like putting it in the glaze or under a glaze right it's potentially going to make my glazes crater a little bit all right I've, I've not actually noticed any difference in the clay body itself as far as cratering or producing other textures. Uh, ilmenite, we have a container of granular ilmenite in the studio at Glass Cell. You can wedge that in. It's like a, it looks like a dark sand as does the silicon carbide actually. But the granular ilmenite 
will actually leave really dark little specks in the clay body which can be quite nice and potentially can affect a glaze that you might put on over the clay once it's misfired. So what I've got here are actually a number of things and so I just wanted to give you a sense of different aggregates and textures they might produce. So this is actually the decomposed granite or the chicken grit and I'm just going to start with this one. Let's get this banding wheel up here. So I just uh, basically pinched out a Yanomi or T-ball. Left the walls, I, I pinched the rim relatively thin to make it comfortable to drink from but left the walls a little thicker so that I can come back and facet that and really highlight that texture. So any material basically that you put into your clay is going to leave a different texture or surface quality when you either facet or, and this is, this is a little soft, you could also just use a rasp or a metal rib. So if this was a lot thinner, I would wait for it to stiffen up to a very, very, very stiff leather hard, could potentially even be bone dry, and then I would just take my metal rib and kind of scrape the surface, but because this clay is soft, I'm not going to get, it's actually not a bad texture, but not the texture that the granite has potential for. So I'm just going to take this little wire tool, facet that. So most of this gray clay I've got here is actually just reclaimed from the studio and I'm guessing that this has a fair amount of paper clay in it, speaking of aggregates or additives, because you can see the little fibers building up on my wire right here. Actually that looks like, uh, I bet those are nylon fibers from the ceramic store. So speaking of additives, especially in the green state, like in the building process, paper, pulp, or fibers add a lot, a lot of strength to your clay body. So, I'm just going to take this wire. So the, the interesting thing, or one of the interesting things I should say, about decomposed granite, is that even if you don't see the granite texture as you cut the clay away, if it's embedded in that clay, it'll actually kind of swell and protrude out of the surface. So you, you could potentially have a perfectly smooth pot, and once you fire it, have those things kind of reveal themselves, which can be kind of nice. So, do that. I'm gonna, this is quite soft still, and certainly too soft to turn it over and carve the foot out from underneath, which I will do one after the demo most likely. But, just to give you an idea, of the texture I'm creating here. Get some of this out of the way. I'm gonna hold this a little closer to you. So you, you can see, uh, actually I don't know if you can see, but right here there's like a pretty deep groove or one of those chunks of granite kind of got drug across the clay from my tool. And you can maybe you can see in the video, I'm not sure, some of the fibers kind of sticking out there. But, in any case, there's that, and I'll try to get these things fired and share the results with this group that I'm making the demo for. So, and then I'm going to let this stiffen up some, and I'll come back and make a much nicer foot in the bottom of here, so I have a nice little T-ball. So, just set that one aside, that's my decomposed granite. Hopefully everyone will have a chance to watch the video before Wednesday morning so that when we 
meet via video conference. You can ask questions if you have them. So this is a little, I guess, whiskey cup or something. Similar thing, only with perlite. So again, the walls are thicker than the rim. I made the rim a little thinner just to make it more functional as far as putting my lips on there. Now, something to be aware of or cautious of is anytime you're adding bigger chunks of things into your clay, there's always that risk of clay kind of shrinking around that. And so if I'm pinching this really thin, I have more of a probability of crack issues starting there. If that thin clay starts to shrink around a little piece of perlite, that makes sense. If it's thicker, it's less of a problem, less, less of a percentage of a chance that it's going to crack there from an aggregate. So I'm just going to facet, basically slicing a plane off of the side of there. And again, it doesn't have to be a facet. I could use a loop tool and carve into this. And speaking of carving, I think some of the best pieces I've seen that really highlight the texture of an aggregate are really thick or even solid carved pieces. And I can't remember if I already mentioned, so I'm going to say it again if I did, but you could potentially add so much perlite or vermiculite or grog into your clay body, like close to probably 50%, just enough clay where you can actually still kind of manipulate it and so that it's malleable to some degree and tacky and just build solid things out of it. And if, if you're wanting to do really thick solid things, that would be the ideal way to approach it. And if I also, if I were doing that since I brought it up, it would be much easier to start with a very wet kind of clay, almost like sour cream, because it's way easier to get a really even mix of aggregate into that and more aggregate. Because if I take clay out of the bag, which you can see that I even poked holes in this and got some water kind of setting in there just to soften it up a little bit. If I just take clay out of the bag and try to wedge a whole bunch of stuff into it, it's going to make it A, really short so that it kind of cracks a fair bit, but also it's going to be really hard to build with because it's going to dry that clay out more. So you get that wet perlite out of the way. So you can see this little whiskey cup kind of thing here. And some of the little white beads in there still, that's perlite, that's evident. And so mo most of that should just disintegrate basically, and especially if it went to cone 10. That would just burn away. At lower temperatures, it might actually retain some of that kind of white little beads in there. So there's perlite. And then I've also got, I talked about building solid things with a high perlite concentration. Here, I've got a little slab so the same clay as that little whiskey cup, just some generic probably paper clay reclaim and then wedged in perlite. You can kind of sort of see that texture on there, all the little bumps or pieces of perlite in there. And basically, instead of going really thick, I'm pinching this one super thin. So. My idea is if I pinch this thin enough where I can actually feel those little beads of perlite on the inside and out that once they burn away I might actually have perforations, right? So if I was going for something that looked really fragile or almost even decomposing, which I often do in my work, this might not be a bad way to approach it. 
So you can clearly I've already rolled and pinched this out a fair amount, but just to show you the process, I'm pinching that some more. And then I just made a little disc here, so I'm just going to wrap that, make a little quick cylinder for the sake of demonstration, and to have it for firing. I'm going to tap, tap, tap. And you can see this is already sort of tearing up on the rim or the top edge. Now, probably should have scored and slipped that. But as you know, when I do demos, I don't always do everything just as I should. Always trying to be conscious of your time. So, just a basic cylinder. And I'll give us something to fire just to see the outcome. And let's put that down. Alright, those are my scraps, not scraps. So, this, I, I said earlier that I've played a lot with different aggregates. I've used slate before, the real flat kind of dark gray rock, and that actually, if I remember right, that turned into glaze basically at higher temperatures, but in lower temperatures, what I was doing is on a really kind of soft leather hard, stiff leather hard piece, taking those little pieces of slate and just embedding them into the surface and making like little stone hinges essentially, little semicircles and things of pieces of slate and then firing those. And then, of course, I'd stick it in there and wiggle it just a little bit to account for a little bit of shrinkage room, right? To make sure that the clay is just not going to try to shrink around that rock and break. Um, I've also fired quartz. So basically that's silica, which has a melting point of something like 3600 degrees. So even at cone 10, that's not melting. So you can fire quartz and essentially it looks just like the rock before and after firing. This little piece is actually just a little piece of porcelain and so I had at one point dug a bunch of native or indigenous clay in Illinois and fired that and basically just turned it into rubble or like grog and so I actually used some of that high iron orange clay and put it into a porcelain body like a, like a heavy grog essentially. And this is just add a little bit left in a container. And so basically I just took and crushed that. Pestle and mortar work great for this. Otherwise I often just use like a, a kiln post on a hard surface and you can kind of smash things. So this is sort of like a grog with the exception that grog is typically fired to temperature right and this is just bone dry so there's actually advantages and disadvantages to both an advantage to this is that it's going to shrink a little bit with your clay right whereas a really coarse grog you'd have to build pretty thick to not have potential cracking issues with clay shrinking around a ch big chunk of grog. An advantage to grog itself is that basically the opposite depending upon how you're using it but the advantage is it's already shrank so it actually decreases the amount of shrinkage in your clay the more grog that's in it. If that makes sense. So I'm not going to use this but you can see I've already got a T-bowl here and I decided to use some Balcones dart for this one simply because this is a white porcelainous grog 
I suppose, let's call it that. And so I thought the white would be a nice contrast to the darker clay body. So, most likely, most aggregates started out being used in clay for very functional purposes, like the thermal shock and adding structural integrity to the wall of a piece, uh, drying thicker things. A lot of industrial ceramic is going to have a fair amount of grog in it, and that's probably in other aggregates. Because if you think about fire bricks, you know, that's four and a half by nine inches thick. That's a relatively thick piece of clay, right? So, we've got this little T bowl. Facet that one. You can see a chunk of the porcelain on the side there. So, as I was saying, a lot of aggregates or additives to clay bodies probably started out more as a functional, practical use, and then evolved into kind of more decorative and special effect kind of things. So I, I've also put pine needles in my clay. I've put le other types of leaves and vegetation in my clay. And that's a nice way to get a really nice fiber base in a clay body. Similar to having paper pulp or nylon fibers for strength. So gives you an idea on that. Hold that a little bit closer. So there's that. You can see some of the white chunks of porcelain aggregate in there, so predominantly decorative, right? That side. Alright, let's put... I've got two more little experiments for you here. I'm just going to combine all my aggregates together in one pile and make a special mix for a future project. So, let's see. Two more things for you. This is actually inspired by a workshop from an Italian artist by the way of Alberto Bustos, who Clay Houston has had in to do workshops a couple times now. And basically, when I went out to prep for this demo, I just thought about things I have in the house that I could use as aggregates. And obviously I have some of these things because my makeshift studio, temporary studio, is here too. But this is cat food. So we just got a new kitten and she came with this really generic food that, according to my wife, is actually not healthy for kittens. And we've actually tried to give this away to a couple of people now and they've both declined it. So what better use than to put it in my clay, right? <laughs> so I think Alberto Bustos actually used like crackers, crushing crackers. I'm going to put this dog food. I've crushed charcoal before and put that in my clay. Charcoal is really interesting in that it can fume with like metallic and almost purple banding colors sometimes. So what I'm going to attempt to do here, and again this is inspired by Alberto Bustos, is I've got some water in this cup. I'm going to go ahead and say three-quarter inch water and basically I'm going to pour some underglaze in there to dilute it and I'm going to try to give these little kernels of cat food some color. So, dump that in there. So what I, what I don't want to do is get that cat food so wet that it turns into mush, right? Which actually I suppose could be interesting as well, although I suspect that if it got too mushy it would just leave a very subtle texture instead of like a big chunks in, of a coarser texture. 
So I'm gonna give this a little stir. Probably should have prepped for this part of this a little bit better, but oh well, here we go, I'm gonna make a mess. So I'm gonna try to put this cat food in here, get it in and out as quickly as I can. Or, I wonder if I could just brush it over the top. So, yeah, I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna get it in there. So, a good thing to take away from this demo is that some of these things I'm trying, I'm just thinking of as I'm going, right? So, I like to drive fast and take chances. <laughs> So I'm going to dump this in here and then I'm going to quickly give it a swirl around and then try to dump off all the excess water into my little bucket of water over here. So I'm just going to put my hand over the top as like a sieve. Alright, so there's a little bit of... I should have started with this because now I'd like to let it dry out before I actually embed it into my clay. But I'll give it a, a minute here and move on to the other thing I was going to show you. Luckily underglaze cleans up pretty easily because I've got it all over my floor now here. It's also lucky that I'm on tile because that cleans easy as well. So in this cup I have miscellaneous types of glaze. Yes, you heard me correctly. So I think most of you who have been in the studio with me at Glassell know that I save all the glaze discard in that there's all kinds of different types of glaze that go into that bucket, right? And so what this is is some of that, essentially. So there's probably some cone 10, most likely some 5, 6, and there's definitely some low fire glaze in here. So this is something that I started doing to basically recycle the glaze discard. I was trying to think of, I guess, creative ways to do that. And so what I started doing is just letting it dry out, crushing it, and wedging it into my clay like I would grog or any other aggregate. And then of course the trick to that is making sure you have some kind of catch basin or something that's encased. Some glaze in here doesn't behave well in the kiln and it's gonna run right off of my piece, right? So generally speaking, I use wadding clay and often seashells on wadding clay as stilts, right? So a very, very refractory clay, little balls that I glue to my piece and that holds my piece off the tray that I've got underneath to catch any glaze drips. And so that way if it does, the glaze does run down the side and off of my piece, my piece is not stuck to the shelf itself, right? Or not the shelf, the, the kiln diaper. So same thing, just going to go ahead and crush these into some smaller pieces. So when I do this, I often don't know what the glazes are, so there's always this element of surprise, but it's also way riskier as far as having glaze drips and runoff and the such. You could be, if you wanted to try it, way more systematic and controlled about it. So I, I like that element of surprise. And part of the point for me is to reuse the glaze that's there. But if I really wanted to control this, I could take, for example, a cone 10 glaze like leach white that I know melts at cone 6 and impregnate it into my cone 6 clay. And so what I would get then is like a bead or chunk or area of a kind of a glossy rock looking like structure in the side of my piece. And so 
I've, I've actually done things like that as well. Actually embedding like big chunks of glaze into a piece. And so usually when I do that, I'll have, we're just gonna, we're just gonna imagine this is the wall of a much bigger sculpture. I might lie that down there. And then basically make a cavity around it, allowing room for the clay to shrink around that chunk of glaze. And this is actually very safe because I'm essentially building a container for that piece of glaze to melt into. But usually when I do it on one of my sculptures, it's actually like on the side built into a recessed texture. And so gravity affects the glaze. And a lot of times I'll actually put it in such a way and then fire my piece a different direction. So once it's fired and on display, it looks like the glaze actually defying gravity and running up the side of the sculpture. So, oh, always, always thinking about the materials and the process and not just the building process, like the firing and what can happen there as well. So, I'm just going to make this weird little organic test kind of thing. So, that's in there firm, but you can see it's got a little bit of wiggle room. Maybe you can see that, I'm not even sure. But that's going to allow this clay to shrink around that to some degree without cracking open. So, put that little dude aside. And then, let's see, I actually prepped this piece of high fire clay so that my concern with some of this reclaim only fires really to lower temperature, to low temperature, 04, 05, before it starts bloating, just depending upon what's in the barrel, but it seems like an awful lot of Longhorn White recently, which is our white earthenware. It's Cat food seems to be drying out fairly well. So I wanted to use a, a high fire clay for this glaze thing so that I can fire it to a higher temperature and make sure the glaze actually melts. So I can do this also and low fire it, but the problem is if I have high temperature chunks of glaze in a low fire piece, it's possible that's just going to be like basically like powder after the glaze firing. So it'd be a really kind of weak spot in your piece. Which again, could probably be used to your advantage with enough thought and experimentation. When I go out and do these workshops, at different colleges and universities, I often tell the attendees or the students that I'm chatting with that I never was good at following directions. In fact, I most often do the opposite of what I'm told. Uh, because of that, I've developed some pretty unusual practices for ceramics. But on the other hand, you gotta know the rules before you break them, right? You've all heard that saying before, I'm sure. I think it was Picasso that said it. It took me four years to learn how to paint like Michelangelo. 
and it took me a lifetime to learn how to paint like a child. I could have messed that quote up though. That's the gist of it. So, just going to pinch out a quick little vessel here. I doubt that these will all be fired to temperature by Wednesday, which may be our last meeting, but if not, I will be sure to zoom you in for at the very least a quick revisit to look at the outcome of some of these things. So right now I'm noticing I've got a chunk of glaze right there on the bottom. I know that's going to be problematic, so I'm going to dig that out. And actually, probably the best thing to do in the bottom is just take some of the same Belcones dark clay and put even just if, even if it's just like a quarter or three eighth inch layer of clay down here that does not have the beads of glaze in it, so it'll be way more likely to have a nice flat bottom than once it's done being fired, and certainly less inclined to stick right to a shelf. The problem with higher temperatures is it's not a good idea to use those stilts, the little wire stilts we at the ceramic store because those things will get soft and actually are inclined to bend even at cone 5, 6 sometimes. And then what happens is the piece tips over and kisses somebody else's piece next door to it and then you got these guys that are fused together making out. Alright, so this is just a weird little kind of organic shaped vessel. I'm just gonna. That'll, that'll be my foot right there, just like that. I am gonna flatten it, set for in a few spots to make sure it's gonna sit well. Setting that aside. Alright, so last but not least, I got my cat food with some, what was that, turquoise, blue green, underglaze, saturation. So, that, that's another thing is, I could just roll my clay in there and this cat food actually has kind of an interesting little star or clover-like shape to it, which could leave potentially a really interesting texture or pattern in there. Or, I could do like I've been doing and really just embed it into the clay, impregnate. I think I picked up some of my perlite there in the process. Need a bigger table and preferably one that doesn't rock all the time when I'm wedging clay on it. So, just wedge that in there and I'm just gonna pinch this into a very simple pot. Actually, I'm going to save that for the top. Yeah. So I can I can see the clay is already kind of breaking and cracking around that cat food, right? 
Now something like this, because the cat food, even though I put it really quickly in the diluted underglaze water mixture, the core of that cat food is pretty dry actually. So if I were doing something like this, or any of them really, even if it was something as simple as like a pinched out little ball, I'd probably bag it for 12 hours at least, or overnight. Kind of let that cat food absorb some of the moisture and even itself out with the clay. It'll be interesting to see if that expands at all and affects the structural integrity of this. But I always say there's one way to find out, and that's to try it. Alright, so, simple little bowl-like shape. I'm going to add a little, I'm going to turn it into like a little bottle, basically. Choking that in. So again, I might could come back with some of this same clay, and I probably will do this, but I'm going to stop the video before I do it. But I might come back and just kind of coil build this up into a nicer, narrower, like little bottleneck. And then I'll try and the, the soft clay without the aggregates, hopefully by adding a couple of coils on the top, will actually give this stuff some, this pot, some integrity. Just so it doesn't start splitting at the top. Stress cracks, seam cracks. Actually, see there's some of that cat food embedded on the outside. I don't know if I had enough underglaze in my water to really retain the color. Probably would have been better to like let that cat food soak in there for a while and then dump it out and let it really dry out. I think most of it's actually transferred to my hands. But there's that. So, hopefully that answers some questions about aggregates and clay additives. And hopefully it also creates some questions that I can address in the future. That more than anything gets you thinking about how you might use additives or aggregates in your clay body or if it's even something that's of interest to you. So. On that note, I hope you enjoyed the demo, and again, I'll look forward to discussing further in the future. Cheers.